Welcome to Archetypes. I'm Lee Woodruff, and I'm here with Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is sort of astronomer, extraordinaire, scientist, neurophysicist, astrophysicist. How do you describe what you do? Professionally, I'm an astrophysicist. You are an astrophysicist, and yeah. you have the vest to prove it. Thank so you. It Thank underlines you. what it is that you do, mm -hmm. which we're going to talk about. Because you, know, you know something? What? Underline is simply the typesetter's instruction for italics. I didn't know that. Yes, that's all. That's why you never see anything underlined in a newspaper. It's just italic. It's a weird leftover curiosity of the transition from typewriter to computer when all you had was a typewriter communicating with typesetters. But see, this is what makes you so fascinating. You kind of know about everything. You are... No, no. You are... Okay, wait. I only right. talk about what I know, and that might sound like everything, but there's a whole lot of stuff I don't know. No, but you know a whole lot of cool stuff. You know Did why you know I know that? a lot of cool stuff? Why? Because when I'm with someone, mm -hmm. and they ask me about the universe, I say I'm not interested in the universe, because I already know about it. I want to find out what you do. Okay. And then I learn about what people do. I don't grow up and only ever talk about the universe. Well, so let's talk about that. You have a, a huge appetite for being intellectually curious. Oh, yeah. Where did that come from? Uh, well, it, it's, it is contained within any adult who has not grown up. So you're still a big child. I'm still a kid. And I think that's true for most, if not every single person who carries scientist as a title. Because what does a kid do? A kid turns over rocks and explores and pokes things. And it takes foresight for an adult to allow that, recognizing that these explorations that usually end up in stuff that's broken are actually experiments on the forces of nature that surround us. Kids don't worry about the weather. Oh, it's raining. Let's go out and get wet. No, you'll get your clothes dirty. Oh, there's a mud puddle there. Let me jump into it with two feet. No, everything is a no. Every time it's snowing outside, now I have to remind myself, but I do open my mouth and catch snowflakes in it just like kids. I, it's a reminder of what I don't want to lose as I get older because that is an inherent state of curiosity that I think we're born with and just get it beaten out of us because it's not mature to jump two feet into puddles. So how did you not get this beaten out of you? What did your parents do right? Uh, so, well, my parents are not scientists. My mother was a housewife, a common profession of the day. My father was a practicing sort of sociologist. Meanwhile, here's their son, the astrophysicist, which I knew I wanted to be since age 11. Many parents want their kids to be what they are or want their kids to be what they tried to be and never mm -hmm. were. None of that went on in my household. They saw what I was interested in, that of my siblings, and they nurtured that. You said you knew what you wanted to do since you were 11. Do well, you were actually, since age 9. Since I was 11, I was able to assign a job title to it. So what was it at nine? That Do you remember the sort of a focal oh, yeah. moment? At age nine, first encounter with a planetarium sky at my local planetarium, the Hayden Planetarium mm -hmm. here in New York City. So Where you are now director, I'd like to point out. Yeah, yes. Which I'm is now pretty darn cool. Director. You know, you go in and you, these big com comfortable chairs and they recline or they lean far back and then they turn out the lights and the stars come out and I thought it was a hoax. Oh yeah, it was a hoax. Because I, I knew the night sky from the Bronx, where I grew up. The sky had nine stars in it, you know? <laughs> and this had thousands, countless thousands. Yeah, of course, later I would know that it was the real sky, and from then on, the universe called me. And I, in retrospect, I think perhaps had no say in the matter. It was just what you were meant to do. Yeah, and so I've been thinking about the universe ever since. And who are your heroes? In your field? Yeah, uh, I'm not very hero driven or role model driven. In fact, I think role model is overrated. In fact, I think it's a bad concept. Typically, a role model is someone who resembles your profile in some fundamental way and you want to follow their steps to become what they are. Okay, so there I am at age 11 in 1969 and I'm going to find a black astrophysicist who grew up in the Bronx. No, there aren't any. So am I going to limit my options in life because maybe I'm going to do something where I'm the first? No. The problem with role models today is you have these athletic role models and then they, they have steroids or drugs or whatever. And then the people who put them up as role models then worry that the kids who saw them as role models now want to do drugs. That's just, it's, no. 
No. If you like their athletics, like their athletics. Carve that out and put it there and reach for that. Don't be the rest of what they are. Who knows what the rest of what they are is? So you are author, astrophysicist, yes. educator, yes. still an athlete, it looks like. Uh, well. <laughs> and parent, and morally responsible parent. parent. I'd, I'd like to think so, mm -hmm. yes. I mean, it's every, maintaining all that is always a challenge, mm -hmm. right? We're all human. But that doesn't mean the goals can't stand there in front of you and where you want to reach for it every day. How have you conducted yourself as a parent then, as the father of two children, and trying to take what you stitched together and then what your parents obviously gave you in such a wonderful way? Oh, so I take some of those lessons that I value and, you know what's interesting? Hmm. Well, what I think is interesting. Their parents, I'm describing a stereotyped case, possibly even a caricature, but We've all heard it, and we'll all understand it when I say it. You get someone who's perhaps born in poverty or born under very hard times, and they struggle, and they do anything they can to make just a buck, and then they finally succeed, and they're actually wealthy, and they want to have a family, and they have kids, and they say to themselves, I don't want my kids to struggle the way I did. That person forgets to recognize or does not realize that they became who they are because of those challenges. Not in spite of them, but because of them. And if you become what you are because of them and you want a next generation to achieve the same, then you gotta put challenges out there. I'm not saying starve your kids the way you had to, but there are other ways you can put the challenges in front of them. How does your mind work? Oh, what I found I remember walking to a library one day and doing the math. Oh, it was a big library that I did this in. And I said, well, at what rate am I reading books? That's a number. We write it down. How many books are there? Okay. If you divide the total number of books by the rate at which you read the books, out the other side comes a time. And that's the total time it will take you to read every single book. And for the library I happened to be standing in front of, it was multiple lifetimes. And that was a depressing moment. It meant I wouldn't know everything that was ever written. So I said, well, there are these little things I can read. I can read about this and that. And when you start this, you wonder, will it ever sum to anything? But as I kept learning, I reached a point where all of a sudden, pathways began to connect them. Well, this only happened because this series of events happened before it. And that happened because this happened at the same time. All of this fragmented knowledge became understanding and wisdom. And I like to think it's still growing. Only if you keep learning does this, can this ever possibly happen to you. If you just said, I, don't, I only need to know this because that's for my job and I don't need to know anything else and I won't, then you have sort of linear knowledge. My most cherished emails that I get are from people who got into a fight at the bar over how black holes will kill you. <laughs> or of the fate of our galaxy, or what will be the, the thermodynamic death of the future of the universe. I love that. What is the favorite way that you spend your time? What's, what's the thing? I like reading use? old science books from centuries ago, watching first how people spoke differently, well, wrote differently, mm -hmm. different palette of vocabulary, and then also how we thought of what was true in the universe and whether or not that perceived truth survived further testing. And look at people who are brilliant but still make certain assumptions that wouldn't be true but would be so obvious later. I would like navigating the tortured men mental pathways of the discoverers that have come before us. If you had to pick, and maybe this isn't a fair question, but is there one discovery that is really the most important in terms of setting the stage for everything to flow from it, whether it's technology today? There are two, separated by 200 years. Okay. Uh, one of them was Newton discovering that there's such a thing as laws of nature that can be written with mathematics. Once you have a mathematical representation of how the universe works, you can now manipulate the equations, and as such, you're manipulating the universe. 
if the equation is an accurate measure of how the universe actually works, then you could do things to the equation and the equation could tell you, hey, look for this and you'll find it. There it is. Set up this other experiment and you'll discover this because it comes right out of the equations. There it is. That was the birth of human beings using laws of nature to predict how the universe works. And that essentially birthed the Industrial Revolution. Another one was the 1920s. Hubble discovers that the Milky Way is not alone in the universe, that there are other galaxies, and then discovers the universe is expanding. And then we discover that the atom and inside the atom is unlike any other laws of physics we had previously dreamt of. It's the birth of quantum physics. At the time, it was like, what good is this? This is just for egghead physicists to entertain themselves. Quantum physics is the very foundation of our entire information technology today. There would be no computers. If, if you added up the value of quantum physics derived technologies to the world economy, it would be like a third of the world economy. The lesson there is, I mean, for basic research, uh, no matter how obscure it may seem to you, if you go up and say, I require that that has a practical use today, mm -hmm. You are cutting you off. Stunt it. Yeah. You are stunting the yeah. future economies of your nation. And in fact, you said something about people challenging the space program and why we need to continue to support NASA. And you took an example of somebody waking up, and if you removed all of those things in their life, can you tell that? I love that oh, example. Yeah, I was just, you know, it's one of these diabolical thoughts you have <laughs> as a scientist. I want to sneak in the dark of night and like take away everything they have in their home that was either directly or indirectly inspired by our journeys into space. Then the person wakes up the next morning and they are technologically impoverished. But not even well, wait, 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 I'm not even, I'm not done. Okay. Then you go in and okay. remove the LASIK surgery that they had okay. because that was enabled cheaply and accurately because of an algorithm used to dock the space shuttle to the space station. And then the next time he drives around the curve in the road right. and he flies off the curb because he didn't have the traction enabled by grooves in the pavement. <laughs> the entire urge to miniaturize electronics was stimulated by NASA's need to make small cameras, small transmitters, small receivers, small everything that ultimately now sit on our hip pocket. I never, ever would have thought of that. I'm just saying. You're just saying it well. I'm just saying. What's the most popular question you get asked? It's, um, is there life in the universe? That's the top three. Another one is, what was around before the universe? Okay. That's a tough one. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a stumper. And occasionally there's like, what is the meaning of life? You know, that's, oh, so people save their biggest questions for wow. the astrophysicist. Can you picture infinity? Can you wrap uh, your hands well, around? Well, in physics, you get early training with infinity. But right? I thought the human mind could not conceive of it. No, you can't. Not really. But you can grow accustomed to it so that it doesn't freak you out when someone talks about it. But Some every time I picture infinity, I put the, a shoebox stops it. And then I do another black thing beyond that. But then there's still... Well, that because there's no shoebox in infinity. <laughs> Leave the shoebox at home. I'm trying. Okay. So now, if you really want to freak out, there are actually some infinities that are bigger than others. Come on. Yeah. Don't blow my mind yeah. like that. Well, yeah, I'm so, I, didn't, I didn't warn you in advance <laughs> about that one. So you can't go to the higher infinities until you're really comfortable with that first infinity. Can you go to the higher infinities? I go, I go two or three infinities. Yeah, I'm good for that. Seriously? Oh, totally. Do you want to go into space? Only if you're going to send me somewhere. Where would you want to go? If they say, oh, let's go into space. Well, we're going to, send, well, we're going to put you in orbit and drive around the block. You wouldn't want to do that? No. What about all these other universes and all these oh, other Oh, I'm being realistic like... within the capacity of our modern day technology. Let's not do that. Oh, fine. Then I'd like to see what our galaxy look like, looks like from above. Mm. Oh, yeah. That'd be cool. Can you picture other planets with all kinds of, like, do you do that? Do you imagine what planets in other, other galaxies? Other life forms? Yeah. But, you know, I'm still trying to wrap my head around all the life forms on Earth. But here's something to lose sleep over. Okay. We can be impressed with uh, life on Earth and its diversity. However, behind closed doors, the biologist has to confess that all the biodiversity represented on Earth is a sample of one 
because all life on Earth has common DNA. Right. You cannot, in science, claim to truly understand your sample unless you have another sample to compare it with. So that's why it's been so difficult to define what life is and what life requires. We can say, well, life requires sunlight or energy or liquid water. And you can make these rules because that's what life on Earth requires. If you find life from another planet and it's life, and it doesn't require liquid water, but it's got liquid ammonia coursing through, then it's, oh, well, life requires just a liquid. Oh, that planet, the star is too far away for the energy to matter. It's using energy from inside its planet. Okay, so life doesn't require sunlight. It requires just energy of any kind. So only when you have another sample can you then compare and contrast. And I would claim, what I like to fantasize about is what that life would look like. It would look more different from life on Earth than any two random creatures on Earth look from each other. So you're taking a mouse. Well, you got me there. Wait, no, and I'm, a hippo. Do you hear what I said? No, yeah. No, no mouse I'm trying. And, no, I'm wait, trying. Mouse and hippo are both mammals. All right. Take a rose and a orangutan. Okay, that's good. Okay. Yeah. They both have common DNA at some point in their DNA strand. Okay. Now you go to another planet, it will look more different from any two things we pluck from the tree of life than those two things look from each other. When you can conceive of the universe as such a vast place, does it A, make you want to live in the moment a little more, or B, make you realize your own significance, or some combination of the two? When you understand what anyone in my field would call the cosmic perspective, it is simultaneously humbling and enlightening. It makes you feel small, yes, justifiably so. But if that sends you into depression, it meant you started with an ego unjustifiably large. <laughs> Good point. So it is the accurate understanding of our place in time and in space. But the fact that our three pounds of gray matter, our 15 pound head, allows us to decode much of what's going on in the universe out to its farthest reaches, is itself an achievement. So at night when you look up, don't feel small, feel large, that what's going on in the night sky is in reach, even if only intellectually. Not only that, the connectivity of us to the universe, of us to all life on Earth, means the next time you walk out the front door, you recognize and embrace the kinship you have with the tree, with the other animals in the animal kingdom. I'm quite convinced that you cannot wage war in the presence of the cosmic perspective. You would just laugh. You say, what am I doing? What, you're standing on the other side of this line in the sand and I want to kill you so I can step over there? And there's this whole universe out there waiting to be explored? I, I cannot imagine. Now, maybe that's why you don't find scientists leading countries into battle. I was just okay? thinking to myself, maybe they should become world leaders. Uh, Perhaps we have less war. Oh, we would, we would be so curious about the stuff we don't know, we would go hand in hand into the laboratory. Space Chronicles. Tell us about the book, and obviously, I mean, you oh, are... Oh, it's simple. It's every thought I've ever had about our <laughs> past, present, and future in space exploration. It's a collection. It's a collection yeah. of all the ways that I've talked about why it is in our collective best interest to have a presence in space. And you make a compelling argument. So, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, thank you so much. Space Chronicles is his book. It's actually a fascinating nonfiction read. <laughs> and I want to thank you for being here. You've illuminated all of us. And well, we, could, thank you. we could go on all day. But I do want to put a big plug in for the book because I think not only is it a smart tome, but it lets us know why we have to keep pushing forward with what we're doing yeah, with thank space you. exploration. Thank you for that. So, thank you for being here thanks with for having us me. today. And thanks for watching Architect. We hope you have enjoyed this video and for more videos go to freakphysics.com.